I'm building a basic chart here to help people to understand the differences between natural law and man's law. Natural law, as we have seen over the past many weeks and throughout this radio show, is based upon principles, first things. That's what principles means. We looked at the principles that natural law was based upon. Okay? We called it um, the principles of natural law, the governing principles, the foundational principles. There were seven of them, and we went through them on a past show. You can get that in the podcast archive. Okay? Principles are things which are foundational. This is what we have to build upon. And the foundation has to be true. It has to be firm. It has to be strong. It has to be based in truth. That's what a principle ultimately is. Something that is based in truth that if you build upon that foundation can do no harm in the future as you build upon that firm, solid, true foundation. That's what a principle is. Okay? Man's law, on the other hand, is not grounded or based in principles. It is grounded and based in something called dogma. Dogma is unchallenged belief in something that someone has been told is true. This is why we have religious dogma. Okay, A religion tells somebody this is the way that it is, that this is true, and then expects people who adhere to that religion to unquestioningly accept and comply to that tenet of that religion. That's what dogma is. It is unchallenged, unquestioned belief in something that has been told, not something that someone knows the direct experience of a thing but through second-hand information that has been communicated to them, often for an ulterior motive. Point for today's show. A little bit later, we're going to be getting into the difference between true responsibility and the abdication of responsibility and how this totally connects in with our free will to bring a positive future into manifestation for humanity or to ultimately have humanity keep going down this path that will inevitably lead to nothing but more and more suffering and finally uh, humanity's extinction in one form or another. So we looked at law, natural law, capital L law, as being based in principles, true things, Fundamental axioms that are not just beliefs, but are actually based in truth and knowledge that can do no harm because they are true. Simply the way things actually are, which we've again talked about over the past 10 weeks or so. Man's law, on the other hand, is based in dogma or unchallenged belief. Not necessarily knowledge or truth, but just a belief system. Now, you can believe in things that are also happen to be true, but if your approach is belief, not determining whether something is actually the case or not, if you just readily accept something as true and believe it, that's basically dogmatic. That means that you are willing to go along with what someone else feels to be true. You didn't actually check into it for yourself. You see... The true harmonization with natural law is not about accepting anything. It's about discovery. As we've said, that's what it's all ultimately about. In the first section that I talked about natural law, it is about discovery of something that exists. The only reason people think it's about acceptance is because they're so stuck in these dogmatic ways of thinking that want to tell you that it isn't about natural law or that maybe even natural law doesn't exist and that dogmatic system has to be rejected so that natural law can be accepted but it doesn't matter whether we accept natural law or not again as I've said many times it is always working it is always in effect regardless of whether it is accepted or not 
It is about discovering its principles and then harmonizing with those principles. And the harmonization with it is often about unlearning what we think we know. From It is about freeing our minds from dogmatic belief systems that are keeping us from the recognition, from the discovery, from the understanding of natural law. And therefore, the solution can never be implemented. Natural law is always voluntarily harmonized with. Voluntarily harmonized with. By way of knowledge and understanding. I'll say that one more time. Natural law is always voluntarily harmonized with by way of knowledge and understanding. That is the way we come to living in harmony with natural law. We have to make a discovery that is based in truth. Th through that we acquire knowledge and then understanding is the acceptance of that knowledge and, and knowing how it all fits together and works. Understanding would be about truly recognizing the way the expressions of natural law worked which we talked about in past weeks, the real law of attraction, the real law of cause and effect or karmic principles. When we understand that, that's how we come into harmony with natural law. It's a process of acquiring knowledge, converting knowledge into understanding, then ultimately acting upon that knowledge and understanding. And that's what wisdom actually is. So that's how we harmonize with natural law. Man's law, on the, other, on the other hand, is not harmonized with. See, it's, since it is based in violence, since it is based on coercion, okay, it is only involuntarily complied with. People only do ever come into compliance with the laws of man because they fear the consequences of not doing so. So, it is complied with only due to fear of punishment, one of the lowest levels of consciousness that one can ever operate at. Fear of punishment is based in fear, the force that shuts consciousness down. It shuts understanding down. You can never grasp how natural law works if you're in fear. And that's what man's law is there to do, to obfuscate the understanding of natural law. By keeping people in fear of the punishment that will result if we don't comply with the laws of man. Which as we've already talked about, may or may not be in compliance with natural law principles. And we're going to talk about what that means for natural law coming up on this show. What that means for man's law, excuse me. If man's law can is just arbitrary and could be just dictated by the people in control at any given time... It's temporarily based. It's based in moral relativism, as we've talked about. And sometimes it complies with natural law, harmonizes with natural law, and other times it does not. What does that mean for man's law? It's going to be a big part of what we talk about here today. The third aspect of natural law that we need to understand is, is that, as we've said in part one on our discussions of natural law, it is immutable meaning that it cannot be changed. That's what immutable means. Muteo mutere means to change. So immutable means unchangeable. It exists for as long as the universe exists because natural laws are self-existing. Man did not place them into creation. The universe itself, creation itself, placed them into existence. And if you're comfortable using the word God, you go right ahead and use that word. I have no problem with the word God put these natural laws here. I have no problem with that at all. Some people have a problem with that concept and, you know, want to think there is no higher power than man. Well, good luck with that. But the point here is a higher power put the laws of nature into effect. You want to look at it as nature itself? I call it the underlying intelligence that is responsible for all matter. 
Whether you want to call that God, that's your choice. But it is the inherent underlying intelligence to all things. The prime mover, if you will, the force that exists and holds everything together and in movement. The giver of movement and measure, as it was called in the ancient Mesoamerican systems. It's been called a million different things. But that means that man didn't put it there. And therefore, man is not in the power to change natural law. We're not going to erase natural law's presence from creation. That's not within our power to do so. So this force of natural law will exist for as long as the universe exists. These principles are inherent to creation. And again, that is something that basically either people recognize through discovery and accept on their own, or they struggle forever against them, against that knowledge. They don't want it to be true because they think that means it makes them a prisoner in this domain. And as we've talked about, that is the dark occultist view. Listening to the podcast, uh, these images will be posted with the podcast. So... Slide number two, this chart that breaks down the differences, the major differences between natural law and man's law. We were at the uh, bottom row where we were talking about that natural law is immutable and exists for as long as the universe exists. And it is about our discovery of those principles and then putting them into operation in our lives that actually keeps us from experiencing self-inflicted suffering. Law, on the other hand, meaning man's law, lowercase l law, changes on the whim of legislators, okay? And we'll get into what that means. If something can change dependent on time, okay, like as an example, alcohol was illegal in the 1920s and it's legal today, okay? On place, okay, there are certain things you can do in England that you can't do in Iraq. There are certain things that you can do in uh, the Netherlands that you can't do in America. So how could this possibly be? How could this be the case? If law is supposed to be based upon a system of morals about r determining right from wrong, the difference between right and wrong, which was another whole show where we talked about the difference, what the actual definition be and differences between right and wrong is. If Man's law can waver so wildly when it comes to what is right or wrong, depending on time and place and other variables, the preferences and the likes or dislikes of the legislators who are making it up. Again, I'm using that term very deliberately, making it up. Then how could it possibly be based in a, tr in a truth, in any form of truth? Truth is unwavering. It exists. It is not subject to the whims of uh, an interpreter, an arbiter. It's what is. Okay? It doesn't make a difference whether we like it or don't like it. And that's what natural law is based in. Now, if man's law is not based in truth, and it is based only on the whims of the legislators, then it cannot be a true reflection of morality. It cannot be a true reflection of any sort of moral understanding of the true understanding of the difference between right and wrong. Therefore, it must be based in moral relativism. Must. This is only, this only logically follows. Because if it was not based in moral relativism, all the laws of the world would be exactly the same everywhere. Now, that necessarily might mean that they might all be incorrect and based on not non-truths. But the point here being is if you have certain things that are able to be done in certain places with no repercussions, no consequences, and in other places they would get you thrown into a cage, there can, these, these arbitrary dictates cannot possibly be based in truths because truth is not open to interpretation. Truth is eternal. It is based in the laws of nature and vice versa. The laws of nature are based in truth. Knowing that the laws of man 
must be based in some form of moral relativism. We talked about the dynamic that moral relativism leads to. And moral relativism only ever leads to more chaos in society. And for those who didn't hear those shows, you want to go back and listen to the shows I did about the um, On Liberty essay by Aquinas and the breakdown of the concepts that were contained in there, which so eloquently help people get to the understanding that if a society bases itself in any form of moral relativism, it can never create true good or true order or anything that resembles true freedom. It is not possible. So this is the big differences. These are the big differences between natural law and man's law and why man's law is so dangerous. It's not the thing that's creating any kind of good or order, true order, or any protection for us in society. As a matter of fact, when you understand what it's there to do, it is there to eternally attempt to keep us away from the true recognition and understanding of natural law and its principles. That's why it's so sinister. Man's law is one of the most sinister forces on the earth because it comes in the semblance of good, in the guise of good. Again, obfuscation. Go back and listen to that section in the previous podcast, the first technique of mind control we covered. Evil never comes showing you its teeth, showing you its horns, okay? It always comes showing you a beautiful, ornate, lovely presence and lovely figure saying, this, this is what you really want. This is going to get you to where you really want to go. And it always takes you in exactly the other direction from that. It has to come in the guise of good, disguised as good. Evil's never going to walk up, sidle right on up to you and tell you, I'm evil. Come down this path. Because you'll tell it to get lost. But if it comes and says, I'll show you everything that you've ever wanted and everything that you uh, want to make happen and give you that capability, and this is all going to create real, true order, then, of course, you'll follow it. See, people would say, well, then how do you know that's not what this is all about, trying to take people down the path of evil? They'll always make that argument. And that's where discernment comes into play. That's where doing the homework yourself comes into play. That's where it's not about dogmatic belief. I told people from day one, the worst thing you could ever do is believe me. You need to understand this for yourself. And the, the more savvy among us would recognize in that middle row there on this chart when I talked about harmonization with natural law, okay? This is all about the process of how to know anything and how that has been occulted as much as natural law has been occulted by the d dark occultists and dominators of this world. Because anybody that's even the slightest bit savvy that heard the words that I used, knowledge, understanding, and then ultimately putting those into practice, which is wisdom, will recognize those as the three steps of the trivium, which is what we're going to talk about next on what on earth is happening. Because this is the process for how do we get to the true understanding of anything? How do we acquire real knowledge? How do we get to truth so that we can then put it into practice and as a result, truly do good, truly do no harm, truly create order? It isn't about believing in those things or just thinking that, oh, we can do it this way. It's about knowing that how that process works. And you can't truly ultimately have any knowledge and know that it's not going to do any kind of harm in how you're using it, how you're putting it into practice without a process in place that shows you this is actually how you come to the awareness that this is based in truth, that this is based in principle, and that when you put this into practice, it can do no harm. And that process was something that people were taught in the ancient world. And it's been removed. Our illustrations of these concepts, uh, three shows Gandhi and then a stack of law books and a judge's gavel.
okay, which uh, illustrate the difference between principles, a man of principle who was attempting to put the truth into practice in life, which is what this life is actually all about, versus dogma, which is all about just the acceptance of what somebody else has told you is the way things are and going along to get along. Slide four shows the difference between true harmonization with knowledge, harmonization with natural law through knowledge and understanding. And again, I'm going to talk about the word knowledge a little bit more because this concept, when it comes to natural law and when it comes to the understanding of the difference between natural law and man is all about knowledge. And there will be solipsists out there who will say nothing can truly be known. That will always be brought up when it comes to this. When I talked about the trivium process, you know that will always elicit this notion that the truth cannot actually really be known. And we cannot know what the laws of nature actually are. That somehow the universe is an eternal torture device that we're placed into and we can never actually not actually know how it operates and functions. And this is bunk. Bunk. There is such a thing as knowledge. It exists and it is knowable. The end. That's the truth. Because the biggest lie is just that. That knowledge cannot be known. Now, I'm not, I've never said we're going to come to know the totality of the mind of God. That's not what I'm talking about when I talk about knowledge. I'm talking about how effects come into being through causality. That is what I'm talking about when it comes to knowledge and how things work, how things are manifested, how the, the interaction between cause and effect works in the real world. I'm not talking about getting into the mind of God and how the universe was actually created and why it exists, etc., so forth. Yeah, maybe there are some things we will never get to a full understanding of, but natural law can be understood. We have to understand what natural law is. Again, it is the method through which we create the experiences that we must undergo. That's what natural law actually is. How it expresses in our life can be understood, can be harmonized with. But you know what? It's called work. It's called doing work to get to that understanding. It doesn't just magically pop on in our brains. There is work required and a process of internal transformation required to get to that understanding. And oh, yes, it can be known. So this image on the left here is, is an image that represents knowledge, true understanding, and then harmonizing with those natural laws to put them into effect and that's called wisdom. That's what the image on the left in slide four represents. Slide four on the right-hand side represents the person in a perpetual state of fear. This is what the image in mind of going against the laws of man is all about. I'm worried that I'll end up here. I'm worried I'll end up in a cage. I'm fearful. See, going back to knowledge for a moment, talk understand the difference between these two states of mind is that the being on the left is going to do the right thing regardless of what happens in the physical do domain. He's going to do it because he knows, not because he thinks or believes or imagines, because he knows definitively that it is right. I'm raising my voice deliberately. Because sometimes these things have to be hammered into people, hammered in, because they're so under mind control and so reluctant. And I'm not saying that raising my voice will do that, but I'm doing it for effect. This is the way that it actually is. And if you want to say you don't know every single in and out of it, well, guess what? Not one person does know the totality of it. That's not what it's about. You know what it's about? It's about understanding it well enough to put it into practice such that you do no harm in the world.
There is such a thing. There is such a concept. You should look into – I like how Terrence McKenna actually worded this in some of his um, lectures and presentations. He said there is such a concept called true enough. True enough. That if you get bogged down in trying to understand every single solitary little tiny, tiny minutia of something, you lose sight of the forest for the trees. You're studying the vein in the leaf and you're not understanding the connection of that wonderful tree to the forest around it, to the living planet that made it possible. And to life itself. You're not seeing the totality of the picture, the big picture, by getting focused down in minutia and talking about nothing but conceptual ideas and never bringing that knowledge down to the ground to work with it here on the earth in the plane of manifestation. Understanding how things manifest on the plane of effects through the knowledge of how causal factors work. And that knowledge is knowable. Ladies and gentlemen, it is knowable. So, slide number five shows the difference between eternal truth and something that is inherent to creation that man did not make, but man can come to understand, can come to know and put into practice in his life through a connection with that oneness, through a connection with that divinity within himself, through a connection with the all spirit. And again, the word all spirit is natural, neter all. The word itself contains the concept. Everything comes from that spirit or divine source. And if we make a one-to-one -one connection with that, we can come to understand how that totality operates enough that we can do no harm in the world and create true order in our lives. The right-hand side of this image shows the arbitrary dictates of a dominator slash controller that thinks he's God, thinks that he has authority over other people. And their, their dominator mindset and dictates is what creates the moral relativism that is inherent in man's law system.